Well, we're back with another edition of our Club Outside Q&A Roundup series, taking a look at a new set of answers coming straight from the man himself. As always, Kubo takes and answers a variety of questions directly from fans over on his personal Q&A platform, and then here we try to dissect those answers and see if there's anything of value to be found. And there's a particularly spicy one this time that's got people rather excited. A lot of the time, Kubo's comments are a mix of light-hearted chatter and and fluff, but sometimes we're given real, genuine insight into the story and world of Bleach that for whatever reason wasn't found in the original material. As before, I'm not looking at every single answer, nor even necessarily looking at them in chronological order. Mostly I'm trying to curate the answers I find to be the most interesting or of the most value. This time the questions revolve around Yamamoto and Unohana's first meeting, how Komamura's human transformation actually works, Kukaku and Ishin's connection, and more. So we'll kick things off by discussing Kubo's comment regarding regarding Yamamoto and Unohana's mysterious history from over a thousand years ago. This time I have to give credit to the incredible work of Tumblr user Reiko Run, who has translated well, pretty much every single Club Outside answer there is, compiling them into one neat and tidy place. It is a fantastic undertaking and greatly appreciated. So then, on to the first answer. We're starting things off this time with what is the simplest answer on paper, but one that's excited fans all over for potential things to come. The history of the Soul Society is one of the most tantalising mysteries still to be truly explored in Bleach. With the story involving the Gote 13 and their crusade against Yuha Bark over a thousand years ago, only just beginning to be peeled back thanks to the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime and its new additions to the story. But of course, the rich history of Bleach's world extends far beyond that into time periods totally unknown, growing murkier the further into the past we reach. There's so much to see, to learn, to be explored, and thanks to one fan, we might have been given a taste of what we can maybe expect in the future. Shigakuni Yamamoto and Yachiru Unohana are two of the oldest characters in the series, and both of them met their fate early on in the Thousand Year Blood War arc when the sins of their past finally caught up to them. Despite being fan favourite captains who have been present in the story since we were first introduced to the wider Gote 13 back in the Soul Society arc, very little is known about their past beyond 100 or so years ago. Yes, we know that Yamamoto founded the Gote 13 and then ruled it with an iron fist, taking Unohana at the time the Soul Society's most diabolical criminal. Under his wing, the two of them then leading a gang of killers with impunity. We know that Unohana created the blood-soaked title of Kenpachi to designate the strongest Shinigami of the era, and we know they both sought to change their own ways and the way of the Soul Society after successfully defeating Yuha Bark's empire in battle. And yet, aside from that, nothing. Despite these two ancient characters being steeped in rich history, their past is a total mystery, shrouded in a shadow like much of the earliest days of the world. And so, one fan took to Club Outside to ask Kubo about these two characters with a question that reads as follows. In what way did Yamamoto and Unohana come to meet? Simple but effective, it's a great question and certainly something I would love to see. Their first meeting would be during the height of their villainy. Yamamoto would be looking to establish a monstrous new order of incredibly powerful Shinigami, while Unohana would be at her most bloodthirsty, desperate for a fresh challenge worthy of her blade. Well, Kubo's answer was certainly interesting, simply read. Reading, I might draw it some day, so it's a secret. Again, simple but effective. Of course, with an answer like that, it's no surprise the community was set ablaze. It's one thing for Kubo to tease the Shikai of three completely irrelevant Shinigami, for him to explicitly talk about drawing the coming together of two characters whose past people would be dying to see is another thing entirely. For me, what's so exciting about this prospect, and I mean there's loads to be excited about, 
is that if this ever does come to fruition, it'll give us a glimpse into the world of Bleach the likes of which we have never seen before. While Unohana's flashback with the child Zaraki is in itself ancient, this would be on a different level. The darkest, most ruthless era of the Soul Society, and something I would be all too eager to read about. This would be before even Yamamoto and Chojiro's flashback from chapter 504, which I believe is the oldest period we've ever seen in the series, in the source material at least anyway. But like I said, there is loads to be excited about here, and I think what's truly making this so exciting is the way Kubo's answer is framed here. Kubo is a well-known tease, as this series itself has shown before, and he'll often keep things close to his chest, as he might use them later, or they might appear later in some vague way. But here, Kubo is explicitly saying he might draw it someday, which is the closest we've come in a while to him saying he may or may not have plans to dive into something that might be readable one day in the future. Clearly, if nothing else, it's on Kubo's mind. He obviously knows how they met, now it's a case of bringing it to life on the page. And so that brings us to another point of potential excitement, and I guess in the grand scheme of things, this would be the thing to be most excited about, but it's also the most tenuous. Sure, having an idea for how they met is one thing, but why would this scenario ever come about? Why would Kubo ever draw this? What situation would arise where these two dead characters might have their first meeting revealed to us? Well, you can probably guess what I'm going to say. Yes, the ever-absent Hell Arc. As always, I have to preface by saying we still have no idea if the Hell Arc is ever going to be a thing. But it's definitely quite conspicuous that Kubo chose to answer this question out of so many. Why Yamamoto and Unohana? How would their past come into play in the future? Well, both captains are dead, but more than that, some level of unexpected posthumous prominence was placed upon them when we read the Hell chapter back in 2021, and it was revealed that both of them, along with Ukitake, were sent to hell upon their deaths, with Yamamoto being granted the title Court Guard Founder, while Unohana was given the name Death Sword. Honestly, it can get a little tiresome to keep bringing up the Hell arc with no substantive idea as to whether or not it's even going to happen, but you can't deny this is intriguing, and it seems to fit the bill. No matter what form the arc may or may not take, it is pretty well accepted by this point, thanks to the Hell chapter, that previously deceased characters will likely play a big part of some kind, particularly the fallen captains of old. And with renewed focus on them down in Hell, what better excuse to show their first meeting all those years ago? Even better if it turns out that every captain from the original Gote 13 is currently in Hell, perhaps serving as our next group of antagonists as has been speculated upon, then it's the perfect time for Kubo to dive into the formation of the original Gote 13, including Yamamoto meeting and recruiting Unohana. That time period is going to need to be unraveled pretty quickly if these characters really do appear and in major roles. Honestly, I can see it now. Yamamoto, similarly to how Aizen recruited the Espada, seeking out powerful warriors to serve under him as leaders of a new army with which they will conquer the Soul Society, claiming dominion over all spirits. A chance to see a truly unhinged Unohana before she even donned the uniform of the Gote 13 would be exceptional as well. Honestly, if I had to envision how said meeting went down, I imagine we would get a fight between the two, however brief, as it's likely that strength spoke the loudest during those barbaric days, and Unohana would relish the challenge. Hell, Yamamoto probably would as well. It's interesting too that the epithets the captains have been given since being cast into Hell seem to boil them down to one particular element of themselves, and for Yamamoto and Unohana, both of those elements relate to their thousand-year-old histories. I wonder if the 
hell versions of these captains will be defined by those epithets in some way, but currently there is no way to know. Or it's entirely possible that Kubo will simply produce another one-shot, this time focusing on the history of the Soul Society perhaps, and to be honest, I'd welcome that as well. I'll take anything at this point as we try and peel back the layers of the past. But regardless, this is incredibly exciting and surprisingly candid on Kubo's part. Will we ever get to see the first meeting of Yamamoto and Unohana? Under what circumstances will it come about? Only time will tell. Up next, Kubo has given us a little more clarity on Komamura's human transformation, his Jinka no Jutsu ability, and how it actually works. Or at least, what the parameters are for its deactivation and Komamura's resulting devolution into a so-called mindless beast of revenge. Obviously, in the source material, we see Komamura confront his mysterious grandfather, the elder of the Beast Man clan of sinners, and attempt to learn the technique in an effort to avenge Yamamoto's death at the hands of the Quincy, willing to place his own life on the line out of his undying respect for the head captain after he took him in, despite his appearance so many years ago. After revealing his now human self during his battle with Bambietta, Komomura defeats her with ease but instantly succumbs to his transformation's curse afterwards, collapsing to the ground with Yuhabark's Castle of Silburn in his sights. It always felt a little arbitrary, and of course very convenient, that Komamura's immortal transformation would last just long enough to defeat the Sternritter, but vanish the moment he tried to do anything else. I, for one, was hoping that Komamura would stick around a lot longer into the arc, but he becomes a cursed beast instead, ultimately unable to achieve the vengeance he seeks. For a long time, many of us assumed that the ability had a timer on it or something like that, and while I subscribed to that idea as well, that only served to make it all feel that much more contrived. If Komamura knew he had such a short window to kill Yuhabak, why waste time with Bambietta? The anime actually addressed this idea somewhat, having Komamura actively leave Bambietta to Shinji, only to return to rescue him at the last second when the captain is defeated. Anyway, Kubo was actually asked a question regarding the inner workings of the Beast Man clan's ancient technique, and it reads... In the Thousand Year Blood War arc, I believe Captain Komamura takes on a human-like form through the humanization technique. However, did he suddenly turn into a wolf after the battle because the technique's time limit had expired? Or is it because Captain Komamura himself was consumed by a desire for revenge? If the reason is the latter, is it correct to assume that as long as Komamura had maintained good intentions, such as protecting the Soul Society, he wouldn't have turned into a wolf. It's a lengthy question, but ultimately a good one, exploring multiple angles too. Firstly, the reader speculates Komamura's downfall is the result of one of two things. Either his ability had a timer of sorts, or it was because he became consumed by revenge. Interestingly, the reader wonders whether Komamura might have been eternally spared this fate had his intentions remained pure. It's a cool idea, and we'll get into Kubo's response in a moment, but it's interesting to think that Komamura wanting to exact revenge on Yuhabak is considered a wholly bad thing in this sense, I would have thought killing Yuhabak might have come under protecting Soul Society, to be honest, but there you go. Anyway, Kubo delivered a solid response too, which reads... You are pretty much correct. The humanization technique is a technique that allows him to maintain a human form while withstanding his grandfather's curse. The moment the purpose of humanization becomes a selfish desire, the curse is forcibly fulfilled and one transforms into a beast. So again, very interesting stuff here. Note that while Kubo says the commenter is mostly correct, he doesn't specify in which way. Could Komamura have remained in this form indefinitely? Perhaps, though this is worded in a way that's a little odd in my opinion. Kubo explicitly says the moment the purpose of humanization becomes a selfish desire, the curse is forcibly fulfilled, but I would argue the purpose of humanization has always been clear and has always been the same from the moment Komamura tried to acquire it, because he himself says as much. He's never wavered in why he wants this power, 
It's to stake his life on a battle where Yamamoto lost his, and to avenge Yamamoto by killing Yuhabak. Komamura's reasoning for having this transformation has never changed, so if that by itself is considered a selfish desire, then shouldn't he have become a beast the moment he ripped his heart out? It's not as though Komamura decided to try out humanization on a whim, and then later thought that he could use this form to exact revenge, it's always been at the forefront of his mind. I'd also argue that Komamura stepping in to protect Shinji and Momo while using his new body is using that newfound power in a very selfless way, yet his form crumbles the moment the battle is over, as though it were only to be used for that fight. Again, the anime slightly improves on this. Komamura is seen briefly walking towards Silburn before losing everything. Whereas in the source material, he quite literally collapses the moment after he deals Bambietta the winning strike. Let's switch gears momentarily and talk about Komamura's sinister grandfather for a moment. I always figured something was up with this guy, but again, Kubo's wording is very interesting. When he calls it his grandfather's curse, does he mean a curse created by the Elder, or a curse the Elder is not only enduring himself, but one that he willingly passes on to his lineage as well? I'm inclined to believe it's the latter, but really we still need more information on this topic. Why was the Grandfather cursed with this existence, and how is he able to hand out this power? Why does it require the removal of Komamura's heart, and how does that really work? Once Komamura becomes a beast, he still doesn't have a heart, presumably, so how is he alive? Komamura himself is presumably not considered a sinner based on what we know of him, so was he born into this clan, doomed to eventually walk this path, perhaps as a representation of Komamura suffering for the sins of his fathers? And going back to that moral quandary I raised earlier, is it really that bad of a thing for Komamura to want to avenge Yamamoto? Not only did Yuhabak brutalize and murder Yamamoto, he disrespected him immensely. And thanks to another answer of Kubo's from an earlier episode, we know that Yamamoto not only took Komamura in, but gave him a family name and everything. He treated him with real care in a way no one else ever had. Now, I understand the need for Komamura's punishment in a philosophical sense, the fact that answering violence with more violence just creates an endless cycle and is wrong, and is really the reason this whole war is occurring in the first first place. But to be totally honest, it seems perfectly natural to me that A, Komamura would want that, but also it seems a little bit harsh for him to be punished so heavily for something that, let's face it, every Shinigami is trying to accomplish anyway. As B, they all want to see Yuhabak dead at the end of the day. This is a war, but it's only really Komamura that suffers in such a cosmic way so immeasurably because of it. Or perhaps does the real issue lie in the fact that Komamura once preached to Tosin about the ill fates of those who walk the path of revenge only to become a hypocrite himself? Even if that is the reason, though, to me it doesn't really line up with the idea of Komamura's purpose becoming one of so-called selfish desire. Also, going back to this notion that Komamura could exist in this form forevermore if he never wants to use it for a selfish purpose again, I guess it could work, ignoring what I said before about Komamura accepting this power for that purpose to begin with. If Yuhabak was already dead, for example, and Komamura had no use for this form in that sense, maybe he would just stay like it forever, though Kubo's wording again makes me wonder if that's really the case, as he mentions the curse will be forcibly fulfilled should Komamura's desires turn selfish, implying the curse will be fulfilled regardless eventually. It's just hastened massively if he wants for something selfishly with it. Ultimately, I'm not sure. I still love this form, this twist, and really everything surrounding it, and I still stand by Komamura having by far the most interesting subplot of all the captains who lose their Bankai, but I feel we still need more clarity, even with this recent answer. But it definitely does help a little bit to know that it wasn't on some kind of arbitrary time limit, so that's great. For the third topic this week, Kubo answered a question pertaining to Kukaku and when she figured out that Ichigo was in fact Ishin's son, and therefore tangentially related to them and the Shiba clan. Something that's unfortunately never actually addressed by Ichigo himself during the story. The question reads as follows. 
When Kukaku sends Ichigo to the Soul King Palace in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, she appears to be aware of the connection between Ichigo and Ishin, saying even if it means making Uncle sad. Did Kukaku somehow sense this, or was there some interaction between her and the Shiba clan or Shinigami she was acquainted with in places that are not depicted within the story after the situation with Aizen was resolved, for instance? It's an interesting question, though admittedly not one that I've ever really considered before. The reader is referring to a scene from chapter 518 where Kukaku is briefly glimpsed in the final arc, sadly the only time she is seen in the entire arc, which was enough to earn her an entry in my coveted Bleach Forgotten Characters series. As Ichigo leaves for the palace, Ganju wonders if it's alright for him to go, but Kukaku says that Ichigo has to go, even if it makes their uncle sad. I think everyone immediately pieced it together that the uncle in question she was referring to was Ishin, despite this scene happening before everything but the rain. As for why Ishin would be sad about Ichigo going to the Soul King Palace, it's never really explained, but I assume it's because they know Ichigo will have to confront his past there, therefore dredging up the truth about Masaki's fate. I don't know why, but when this scene cropped up for the first time in the source material, I just immediately accepted that Kukaku knew who Ishin was, and that was that. Instantly assuming he was probably going to be a Shiba, but thinking about it, it does raise some questions. And Kubo's answer reads as follows. Kukaku has been aware of this through Ichigo's Reiatsu since the beginning, Volume 9. That's why she let Ganju go with him. Of course, she also received a message from Kisuke at a later time. So, from the moment she felt Ichigo's Reiatsu, Kukaku knew that he was related to Ishin, and therefore indirectly to herself. Considering that's quite a surprising thing to suddenly learn out of the blue when this character turns up on your doorstep, it's impressive that she kept it to herself, but I wonder if Ganju could tell too. Honestly, it seems a little unlikely to me considering the amount of time he and Ichigo spend together without him saying a single thing about it, plus his overall feelings towards Shinigami in the Soul Society arc as well. Interestingly, the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime adds a brief shot of Captain Ishin standing with Kukaku and Ganju, and if we're meant to take that at face value, then Ganju should know Ishin's Reiatsu just as well as his sister. I wonder why sensing Ichigo's relation to Ishin made Kukaku feel alright about sending Ganju to the Soul Society, though. It's possible she and Ganju felt ostracised from the Soul Society for many years, perhaps after Kayan's death, and Ishin as a captain was their only real remaining link to the Gotei 13. Speaking of the Gotei 13, if Ichigo's relation to Ishin is that obvious through his Reiatsu, then presumably both Hitsugaya and Matsumoto realised the truth the first time they met him as well. And there's a little more to it than that too, although they wouldn't have spent that much time together, we see Ishin in a captain's meeting with characters like Kyoraku, Byakia, and other characters who would eventually come into contact with Ichigo. So do they all immediately know that Ichigo is related to Ishin just through his Reiatsu? It's weird because the possibility of a familial connection to the Shiba clan is brought up numerous times throughout the Soul Society arc as characters like Byakia and Ukitake comment on how similar Ichigo looks to Kaien, but there's no mention of their Reiatsu feeling the same or anything like that and nothing that would link him back to Ishin. If they did know, then luckily all of these characters decided to keep it a secret from him. Finally, we've got a very short but interesting character tidbit about a couple of supporting antagonists. Lowly Avern and Menely Malia, Aizen's two Arankar aides. The reader asking the question picked up on the fact that both Lowly and Menely share very similar masks, which might imply some kind of sisterly relationship, asking a question that reads as follows. The masks of Lowly Avern and Menely Malia appear to have a design that forms a pair with the left and right eyes. Perhaps they are Aranka with a relationship like that of twin sisters. Now, I can see why the reader would think this. Their masks do indeed seem to reflect one another, which would imply some kind of familial connection, you would think. But, at the same time, the only actual example of Rankar siblings we have, Xyloporo and Il Forte Grands, 
have masks and resurrections that don't resemble each other at all. Not only that, but even in death they share a surname where Loli and Menoli don't. Though their first names are strangely similar, which based on Kubo's upcoming answer makes me wonder if they're not their true first names. And Kubo's response was, Although these two are not sisters, they have taken a sisterly vow and shaved down their masks in order to resemble each other. And so, while they're not sisters, they went so far as to physically alter their masks to make them resemble one another. Considering their mask fragments do look virtually identical, there must have been some serious manipulation there. I wonder if they both changed their masks, or if only one of them did in order to be closer to the other. Likely Menely, as she was the more submissive of the the two characters. Either way, even if they did shave down their masks, their eyepieces still would have to look like that in the first place, so they must have somewhat resembled each other to begin with. Also, how does an Arankar go about shaving down their mask, and does it have any repercussions? Is it similar to what Findor was doing with his mask, or is that power unique to him? Presumably, forcibly breaking down and removing parts of your mask is a risky endeavour for an Arankar, so they must have really wanted to highlight their bond. Which brings me back to their first names. Considering they do sound so similar, I wonder if when they undertook their sisterly vow, they also changed their names. Again, it wouldn't surprise me if Loli was always called that and simply made Menoli change hers. I will say, as we close out here, that Loli's Resurrection Escolopendra doesn't really seem to resemble her mask in any way when active. Sure, she still has the eyepiece, but it doesn't really fit with the overall design, in my opinion anyway, and the teeth on the mask are now completely missing as well, with no real evidence of where they could possibly be. I guess that doesn't necessarily mean anything, but I thought it was interesting nonetheless. But that's it for the video and the latest edition of our Club Outside Q&A Roundup series. As always, I really hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments which answer was your favourite which you found the most interesting. This time I'd love to hear your thoughts. Are you excited to potentially, it's still only a potential, but potentially see the first meeting of Yamamoto and Unohana drawn by Kubo? In what form do you think that would take? What do you think about the revelation surrounding Komamura's human transformation? The fact that we now know what the conduit was for him turning into a mindless beast in the first place? And let me know your thoughts regarding the Kukaku and Ishin connection and the piece of information regarding Loli and Menoli. I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. And as always, I want to end this video by saying a huge thank you and giving a massive shout out to my wonderful patrons, my supporters over on Patreon. I really do appreciate each and every one of you so, so very much. It means the absolute world to me that you continue to support me over there. So thank you again. I really do appreciate it. And if you want to take that support for me another step further, you can support me over on Patreon as well to get your name in the credits like this and to get every video I release absolutely ad-free. All right, guys, but until next time, I'll catch you later, and I'll see you then.